Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Psychology 32, Lifespan Development. Today we'll be going over Chapter 13, and we'll be going over uh, the school year's psychosocial development. A little bit about this week. There are no deliverables due this week. Next week you'll have a discussion board, um, and we're starting to come down to the end. So this lecture is going to be a little bit on the shorter side. Um, we're going to talk about what's happening um, in the school years interpersonally. If you've noticed, we've skipped um, chapter 12, um, and we're going to be skipping a few chapters now throughout the rest of the semester because I want to get us to adulthood. Um, and a lot of the bio uh, biological things that we would normally talk about um, are beyond the scope of this course. It's, it's a course in child development, and it's a course in psychological development. So we're going to be skipping over some of the biology chapters. Um, we'll still be talking about some of the cognitive things that happen, but we'll be focusing mostly on the social and interpersonal uh, expectations that happen in adolescence, um, early adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. Okay. Again, if there are any questions throughout the, the semester or the lecture, just email me and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Okay. All right. So first, one of the things that becomes very, very important in the school years is the peer group, right? So the peer group literally translates to people of the same age as you. Um, the peer group becomes very important in the school years, and then it becomes sort of exponentially important in, um, in adolescence. So what tends to happen is, is that the parent-child relationship tends to become less salient. It's not that it's not important, but the child tends to value the influence and the opinions of his or her peers more than the child tends to value the um, influence of his or her parents. Okay, Children become very, very aware of how they give themselves off to other people and how other people interpret the way that they look, the way that they act, um, the way that they dress, the way that they behave, etc. Okay, Now, within this peer group, uh, a culture develops. Okay. Um, there are a set of rules that develop and there are a set of norms that people follow and we call this the culture of children. Um, and th this culture develops on its own spontaneously. It's passed down from, you know, one child generation to another. It doesn't come typically directly from the parents, although obviously indirectly some rules and norms come down from the parents. But the, the, the group itself develops its own, its own rules. Uh, if anybody's ever seen um, or read Lord of the Flies, um, where the, these bunch of children basically stranded on an island with no adults develop their own set of rules and culture. It's almost like that in, in school or in children's social groups where they ultimately end up developing particular roles, particular um, norms, particular things that the children will follow. Um, and it's they come about somewhat spontaneously, and it's interesting because they rigidly follow those rules. So one of the first things that tends to happen is, is that parents and child tend to distance from each other. The child tends to, to have less of an investment in um, you know, what the parent has to say. Um, that's one of the first big things. And some of the common roles at this age is you know, parents should not kiss their children in public. Um, children shouldn't go out of their way to please the teachers. Nobody wants to be the teacher's pet. Um, children should never betray other children to adults, right? Don't rat. <laughs> Um, and children shouldn't wear the wrong clothes, right? Um, you should be very careful at how you dress and what you wear. Um, you don't want to be too different, okay, period. You, you want to be a little bit different sometimes, but you don't want to be too different. You don't want to stand out, okay? Another thing that tends to happen is something that we call deviancy training. And deviancy training is where children pass on, uh, pass on techniques and skills um, to help them avoid adult rules and uh, avoid adult restrictions. Um, kids will teach other children how to sneak out at night, um, or kids will teach other children how to um, cut class and you know not get the phone call home, or you know get the phone call home before the parent knows, or um, teach other children how to not have parents see their report cards. Um, these are all examples of, of deviancy training, how children help each other um, sort of get out of adult rules or restrictions. Um, I remember, I remember, um, <clears throat> I had, I have a friend who's, who had a slightly older sister 
and the sister would sneak out all the time and they would always kind of collude uh, on how to figure out how to get the sister to sneak out of the house without getting caught and the father was a police officer so you can imagine what might happen if it was found out that she was sneaking out but um, they used to sort of work together and collaborate and figure out how to how to get out um, how, to, how to have the older child sneak out at night um, and uh, you know it's just one example of deviancy training and I'm sure um, we've all seen examples of it uh, as we were growing up. So, um, okay, let's keep going. Now, common values from 6 to 11. Uh, protect your friends, right? So we kind of talked about that without ratting. Don't tell adults what's happening. And again, don't be too different. Don't stand out. Okay. Now, socially, your social roles and um, what happens to you on the social level becomes vitally important. But it's important to understand that um, social groups are going to change, right? The kids who are cool don't always stay cool, and the kids who are not cool become cool later on. Um, and this changes, you know, not only within a person's lifetime, but it changes across generations. Um, but think about it, you know, think about who might have been the cool kids when you were in elementary school versus the cool kids in middle school or high school. You know, I'm thinking back and in elementary school, there was this one kid who had a mullet. And uh, if you don't know what a mullet is, it's a type of hairstyle where uh, the hair is short and spiky on top, it's shaved on the sides, and it's long in the back. Um, and this kid was the coolest kid in my classes. Absolutely the coolest kid. And as I got older, um, the, the idea of the mullet hairstyle, um, and hopefully, you know, I don't mean to be offensive if anybody has their hair that way, but the idea of a mullet hairstyle became something that was culturally specific. It became more Midwestern. Um, and in the Northeast, where I grew up, this was not something that was seen as popular or cool. Um, they were actually a lot of jokes told about mullets. Um, as, you know, as I got older and, and, and it's what was stylish changed. So, again, the, the same kid who was really, really cool in remember uh, fifth grade or sixth grade um he would be one of the least cool kids um in middle school or high school and it was just amazing to kind of see that shift um now when we talk about so we're talking about now the, the cool kids on the other end of the spectrum they're the kids that are typically unpopular and there are three different types of unpopular child um some children are just shy we would call them the neglected child okay and not neglected in the sense of the fact that they're actively shunned. Neglected children are just children who tend to be quiet for one reason or another. They tend to really be kind of on the periphery of what's going on socially. They're not heavily involved. Um, then there are children who are rejected. Okay, Rejected children are children who are actively ostracized, actively moved out um, of social groups or kept out of social groups. And this happens... Um, typically for two reasons. One, either they're aggressive, and the aggressive children tend to really not be involved in social groups because the truth is other, other kids are afraid of them. You know, when you're an aggressive child, the other children really never know when you're going to turn on them. Um, when I was in elementary school, there was this one kid that transferred into our school from a different school, and he must have we never knew the circumstances as to why he transferred. He came over to our school in the sixth grade. I don't think he had moved um, I think he must have just been kicked out of his own school for violence. And this kid came to our school and he, every single day, he would just beat somebody else up. And you never knew why. You never knew when. And he was really just going to have a fight. Um, and, I mean, he was just kind of, you know, <laughs> at another level when it came to fighting. I mean, there weren't there weren't a lot of fights in my elementary school. and um, And this kid just kind of... He was always violent, and he had very few people that wanted to talk to him or wanted anything to do with him, purely because of the fact that they didn't know if they were next, and you just felt like it was better to stay away from him. And so he would be one of the aggressive, rejected children. That's different from withdrawn, rejected children. So withdrawn, rejected children tend to be children who are very anxious. Um, it, they they might have poor emotion regulation. They get upset very easily, or they they tend to be very reactive and things like that. Um, they're typically not violent. They're just children that tend to be a little bit unpredictable. 
And one of the things that's important to understand is, is that children, other children, don't like unpredictability. Children tend to prefer consistency. Children tend to prefer things that they can expect. And these withdrawn children, these withdrawn rejected children tend to be anxious um, and they tend to be unpredictable with their emotions, which is off-putting for other children. So they tend to have a hard time mixing in in social groups and they tend to have a hard time making friends. Okay. All right. Friendship becomes very, very important. And typically what happens um, as our friendships tend to develop and as we get older, the trajectory is that we tend to have fewer friends, but our friends tend to be closer to us, okay? So when you're very little, when you're five or six years old, you know, everybody's your friend. Oh, so-and-so's in your class. Oh, it's your friend. When you're moving into, you know, late childhood, adolescence, things like that, fewer and fewer people, if you're, oh, no, that's not my friend. No, no, they're just in my class. Um, so-and-so is my friend, and so-and-so is my friend, but that person, no, 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 they're not my friend. But the friendships tend to get deeper and more meaningful and closer. And think about it now. Think about your life now. How many close friends, not acquaintances, I'm not talking about, you know, Twitter followers, I'm not talking about Instagram followers, I'm talking about close friends. How many close friends do you have right now versus how many people would you have considered to be your friends um, in early childhood or middle childhood, right? You were in a class of 30 children and 29 of them were your friends. Um, in middle school, you were in a class of 30 children and 10 of them were your friends. In high school, 30 children and seven of them were your friends, right? I'm talking about close friends, okay? And people tend to become friends with people who share interests and share values, right? Um, people that you can connect with, okay? And they're the, ten, they're the ones who tend to be, um, who become closer friends with you than other individuals who, who tend to go in other directions, and that's perfectly normal. So now we're going to talk about bullying a little bit. And, um, you know, one of the things that is sort of very salient in the news and very salient in the media nowadays, um, Lady Gaga had picked it up and she's been talking a lot about it, is um, bullying. And when, when we're talking about children's social worlds and social roles, inevitably bullying is something that comes up. Now, I have two video links here. Um, and in class, uh, in a face-to-face -face class, we, we typically have discussions about these videos. So we won't get the chance to have a discussion about it directly. Um, but I want to warn you about both of these videos. Um, so the first video, and then we'll talk a little bit about bullying. The first video is a video clip that um, came out of Australia. Um, there was a, a smaller boy and a larger boy and then a group of other children and the smaller boy had started um, hitting the larger boy and this is all we see in the video as he's hitting the larger boy and then the larger boy uh, at a certain point reacts um, basically picks up the smaller boy and, and slams him to the ground um, and it's just very clear that the smaller boy has some type of leg injury after the fact and uh, he's sort of hobbling off and um, that quickly ends the the interaction. Um, the second video um, is a partial clip of uh, a girl at a party. This this happened a number of years ago already. Um, and basically, what happened the shortest version of this is is that um, this girl who had been dating the ex boyfriend of another girl got invited to a party. And she got invited to the party at the ex-girlfriend's house. Um, she wasn't dating her. She wasn't dating him at the time that she, he was with the ex. The, the two had already broken up. Um, but she dated him after the fact. And so she got invited to this party. And when I say party, I'm using air quotes here because it wasn't really a party. And the intention was to confront the girl. To confront the girl who had been dating the ex. And... Uh, it escalates. Um, it, it escalates uh, to the point at which she's she gets beaten up um, multiple times repeatedly by um, many different girls at the party. So you can sort of see a clip of this. And um, there was a couple of boys at the party, and the boys were filming this. I mean, it was a really horrific scene, and it just went on and on and on. The beating, um, you know, they would start hitting her and stop and start and stop. And again, it's something very graphic. I, I highly. Um, you know, I highly recommend that you, you watch this with caution, um, just because it can be disturbing. 
and I've seen it a few times and it's still disturbing. Um, and you know, the thing, the thing about this video, uh, well, we'll talk about it in the context of bullying. Um, but you know, one of the interesting things that ended up happening with this video was at a certain point, um, the girl tries to leave, uh, the one who was being assaulted and they close the door and they don't let her leave. They say, no, you can't leave. I'm not done yet. And what ended up happening was this wasn't just an assault charge after that. I think it, I think the charges got up to kidnapping and it became a, a felony charge. And then there was a whole issue about the age of the girls that were assaulting her and everything else. And anyway, so why do I show these horrible videos? The reason why is because bullying is one of those things um, that has been that that's definition has has been sort of misused or misrepresented over time when we talk about bullying it doesn't mean being beaten up you can be beaten up and that's not a good thing and it's an assault but that doesn't mean that it's bullying okay bullying is something that's specific and if you look at the definition of bullying we're talking about repeated and systematic attacks intended to harm those who are unable or unlikely to defend themselves and who have no protective social network. Um, now, look at that definition very carefully. Repeated, systematic, and who, who are unable or unlikely to defend themselves and have no social network. Okay? Kids are mean to each other. It happens. And I'm not minimizing the significance of an experience when somebody was mean to you. It's terrible to be mistreated in any way. But there's a line between being, you know, mistreated and being bullied. Being bullied is systematic. It's repeated. It happens for a protracted period of time. And the reason why I show both of these videos is I'm not saying if they're bullying or not. But what I am saying is, if you compare the definition to the video, it's not clear if it's bullying. Okay? Um, with the first video particularly, it's one fight. It's one fight. Now, I don't know what happened before the video. I don't know what happened after the video. I don't know what the relationship was. But everybody called this a bullying video. It was a fight. Okay? This video, per se. Now, again, they might have been bullying. Okay, um, the, the smaller boy might have systematically and repeatedly attacked this, this larger boy and it might have been a thing where this larger boy had no ability or intention to protect himself and this is after 30 or 40 incidents um, and he reacted. So in that case, yes, we can argue that it was bullying. But to just watch this video of when a more brazen kid picks on a kid who appears to be more quiet and call it bullying is really overusing the word bullying okay it, it really is if you're taking just this one incident now the girl at the party video that's a different situation but again the argument can be made in two different directions right in one direction it's easy to see hey wait a second you know, this girl is being assaulted, um, you know, there's multiple people doing it, she's, she's unlikely to defend herself, it happens repeatedly. You know, again, this is where it gets difficult to talk about, right? I don't want to minimize the significance of this girl's experience. She went through something horrible, something that nobody should go through. Um, but at the same time, if you look at it in the other direction, um, was this that she was just in essence jumped by a group of girls and it was a horrific assault and it was just considered one horrific assault that happened because of multiple people or were these considered separate incidents or instances you know there was um to make an analogy um september 11th with the world trade towers um the owner of the world trade towers had an insurance policy on the towers and you know, they got hit with the planes and the towers fell. And he had each building insured for a billion dollars. Uh, sorry, he had a catastrophic incident insurance policy. Um, and each catastrophic incident, he would make a billion dollars. And he would get paid a billion dollars. And so what ended up happening was um, he tried to collect from the insurance company and he said, I want two billion dollars. And the insurance company said, no. And everybody 
this is, wait, why? What do you mean? And so the insurance company went to court and said, you know, the president called this a terrorist act. And if you called it one act, even though there were two towers and two planes, you called it one terrorist act, that is one catastrophic incident, and you will get one payout of $1 billion. Um, and that's all they paid. And the original court settlement said $1 billion. The, 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 guy, the guy who owned the towers went back to court, uh, got a different lawyer, saw a different judge, and then basically said, listen, you know, uh, argued it in court and won the argument. And then they broke this up and said two separate attacks, two separate incidents, two policies, you know, two payouts. And he won $2 billion or, or he received $2 billion settlement. And again, it's, it's two different ways of looking at the same thing. You know, is this a girl who has jumped at a party? If it is a girl who's jumped at a party, by definition, it doesn't meet criteria for bullying. If it's a number of incidents that happen, then it can be argued that it is bullying. Why do I make this distinction? So it seems like I'm talking a lot about something that might not be that important, but one of the things that's important, especially when we think in terms of cognitive psychology, is perception. Cognitive psychology argues that your perception of what happens is as important, if not more important, than what actually happens. Your interpretation, your processing of the incident um, is as important or more important than what actually happens. Okay, this becomes important, especially when we're talking about child development, right? You can have, imagine a scenario where there are two different children. Uh, one of the children grows up, well, both children grow up in a lower middle class home. Both working parents um, had food in the fridge, but never had too much extra, had some presents, but not too many presents. You know, when they were growing up, they're in holiday time. And, um, you know, car was in the shop a lot, didn't really ever afford a new car and grew up and, and, and ultimately, you know, ended up, I don't know, having a, a more prestigious job, uh, something in law or medicine or whatever. Both kids had the same upbringing. One of the kids says, I had everything I needed. No problem. You know, my, my life, you know, we weren't rich. I mean, stretch the imagination, but we certainly weren't poor. And they end up growing up healthy and well-adjusted. Now there's the other kid. All right. Same scenario. He's like, I was poor. I grew up poor. My life was hard. I never was handed anything. And I, you know, I'm going to hoard every penny I've ever seen because there's no chance in the world that I'm ever going to lose that money again. And, you know, think about how living your life with this internalized psychological trauma, psychological distress could affect you later on. You know, it's as dangerous, or the argument can be made, I should say, where we could say that it's as dangerous to allow somebody to believe that they were bullied when they weren't, as it is to ignore somebody who's being bullied and say that they're not being bullied when they are, okay? It's important on both sides. It's important to make sure that somebody who's being bullied um, is, is protected and intended and the situation is remediated, but it's also important to make sure that we're not saying that people are being bullied when they're not, okay? So anyway, it's just something to think about, and I'm not saying that the people in these videos are being bullied or are not. It's just something to look at and then, and then kind of debate Okay. Now, bullying doesn't have to be physical. It can be verbal, right? Uh, there's the whole issue of cyberbullying. Um, you know, it can be it can be done through tweets. It can be done through posts. Um, bullying, you know, used to be done through chat rooms and things like that and emails. Um, but you know, it doesn't have to be physical anymore. The standard bullying typically was physical. It doesn't necessarily have to be anymore. Um, Boys typically bully through physical violence. Girls typically bully verbally, socially, or interpersonally. Um, boy bullies typically are bigger physically. Um, girl bullies are typically quicker with their tongue, quicker with their responses, sharp, sharp-witted, things like that. Okay. Um, victims of bullying tend to be cautious or quiet. They tend to be lonely. They tend to be anxious. They tend to have very few friends. <coughs> and... Unfortunately, um, 
bullying tends to get worse as people age. It tends to not get better. The victims tend to get traumatized. Um, the bullies tend to become more brazen and bold. And <clears throat> when we talk about bullying, excuse me, one of the biggest assets to bullying um, is that it works. And I don't mean to say that I'm advocating for bullying. Absolutely not. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But most of the time, bullies get away with their bullying. It happens behind closed doors. And if you think about the culture of children, where we're not supposed to rat, we're not supposed to suck up to teachers, right? You know, you don't tell somebody if you're being bullied. And so a lot of the time, bullies get away with the bullying and the bullying serves a purpose. They might be bullying for money. They might be bullying for status. They might be bullying to make themselves seem more popular. Um, and so it works in a lot of ways. You know, nine times out of 10, the bully's gonna get away with it. And so one of the biggest assets to bullying is that the bully gets negatively reinforced or positively reinforced, depending on how you look at it, but the bully gets something that he or she wants. Um, so that's one big asset to bullying. And the second big asset to bullying is the culture of children. Right, we talked about that before, where children don't rat on each other, they don't tell each other what's happening. Third big asset to bullying is that the truth is, is that um, it's very hard for adults to intervene with bullying. It's hard to get it to stop. You know, <clears throat> there's no real research that has definitively talked about effective techniques at reducing bullying. People have theories, people have ideas, but you know, when bullying happens behind closed doors, it's hard to know what inspires it, and it's hard to know if it really has gone away. So if one kid bullies another, and then I reprimand the bully, and what's the bully going to do? Well, the bully's going to come back at the kid that they bullied and say, how dare you have ratted on me, and they might really go to town on that kid later. And then that other kid's saying, no, I'm never saying anything again, because look at what happened. You know, a lot of the times the bully is ingrained um, with administration. Um, I, uh, it's a terrible incident, but I, I knew a kid in high school who was, um, quite violent and, uh, quite assaultive. And I remember just walking by him one day and I, I knew his reputation and, uh, he was talking with one of the security guards and invited him to a party at his house. When the security guard seemed to know him, and he said, yeah, I'll probably be there. Didn't have to give him the address, so he clearly had known where the kid lived, and he, they were likely hanging out outside after school. And so this guy's a violent guy. He's had a reputation, and, you know, how do you, how do you stop that violent behavior when the people who were supposed to stop it are friends with him? And that's not uncommon. You know, a, a bully, you know, kind of becomes friends with the principal and they spend time in the principal's office and the principal might seem like they're, you know, chastising them in public, but then they sit down, oh, let's get you a soda, let's get you a drink, right? You know, because it's easier to manage. It's easier to manage that than get than get confrontative. Um, so a lot of the time, the system itself um, fosters this bullying and there really is no good research to, <clears throat> to show or, or to that that's been shown to reduce bullying. And it's an unfortunate thing. Nowadays, with more awareness, they are working on different intervention programs, um, some of whom have been reported to be effective, but they're typically reported um, through anecdotal evidence and um, you know the places that are running the program say that they're effective, but um, without the empirical research to support it, um, I don't really want to talk about it too much because we don't know scientifically if they're working or not. Um, but it is something that is getting more attention, <clears throat> which is at least the first big step um, in reducing the incidence. Okay. So again, um, when we talk about solutions to bullying, we don't really have many good ones right now. Okay. I will tell you that one solution is to not ignore it. Okay. Um, but again, we don't know the best way to fix it or to stop it because it's as much of an interpersonal and common issue as it is a systematic issue or systemic issue. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, one other last thing to talk about really, really quickly. Um, and this is just thrown in the chapter. So, um, it's an important concept that is an important idea. We talk about um, developmental psychology, but it's sort of thrown in the chapter at the end, and it's something that we call resilience. Resilience is an individual's ability to withstand stress, okay? 
and there is a lot of research on the idea and on the topic of resilience okay because when we look at children and and even adults some children or adults face severe stressors and they come out very okay and other children and adults face similar stressors and they're not okay and vice versa some children and adults face mild stressors they you know they're, they they live um pretty uninterrupted lives and they still don't do that well and and some children um and adults you know live mildly stressful lives and they do very well okay and so it's difficult to to figure out um it's difficult to figure out why um you know some children some children do better than others and some adults tend to do better than others right when it comes when it comes to facing these these stressors. It's, it's hard to say. Why does one do well and why does the other one not? Um, and the thing that they've attributed this to <clears throat> is this internal quality called resilience. And so now there are a lot of efforts to try to really hash out what resilience is, number one. And number two, once we really have defined resilience, figure out how to increase it. Okay. I mean, think about it. Think about um, soldiers, <clears throat> soldiers fighting in a war. Um, you know, some of whom will develop PTSD and some of whom won't. And why do some get it and why do some not? And the argument is, is that the ones who get it have a higher level, sorry, the ones who do not get PTSD have a higher level of resilience and the ones who get it have a lower level of resilience. And this is not to chastise the individuals who get it or blame the individuals who get it. Um, the thought is, is that let's figure out how to increase resilience. And so resilience is defined as a dynamic process that encompasses positive adaptation within the context of significant adversity, basically the ability to cope and thrive in the face of stressors, okay? And so, again, as we move about the literature, um, what they're looking at doing is trying to find ways to increase resilience and things that we can do. Um, nothing's definitive as of yet. We haven't figured out the best ways um, we haven't figured out the best ways to, uh, to increase resilience, um, but people are, are working on it, actively researching it and trying to increase it as a whole. Okay. All right. Um, if there are any questions, as always, email me, david.troy at kbcc.cuny.edu.